Welcome. Uh, good <coughs> afternoon in uh, New York. I'm Lance J. Brown, the president of the Consortium for Sustainable Urbanization. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to this event, our very first in a year-long series of discussions with thought leaders around the world on our progress towards greener cities for all. Our guest today, is Dan Zarilli, has been a central figure in New York City's sustainability and resiliency initiatives, and it's my great pleasure to introduce him and moderate today's program. For those attending who've requested AIA continuing education credits, you'll receive one HSW credit, and please, you must stay for 45 minutes. The CSU is an organization dev devoted to building bridges between the United Nations and civil society, the design professions, business, academia, and allied organizations. The mission of the CSU ranges from increasing awareness about emerging issues, facilitating knowledge transfer between and among policy and decision makers, and fostering connections, cooperation, and collaboration, while all the time promoting the UN's 17 Sustainable Development Goals, the SDG, especially Goal 11, as well as the new urban agenda adopted at the 2016 Habitat 3 meeting in Quito. In the spirit of collaboration, we want to make sure we thank all of today's program partners and specifically UN Habitat's New York office, Chris Williams, director, and Naomi Perek. We thank you for your help. AIA, the New York chapter, Ken Lewis, president and executive director, Ben Prosky. The UN Habitat Professional Forum, Mona Reddy. The NGA committee, NGO Committee on Sustainable Development in New York, Margo Lazaro. Columbia's CBIPS program, Rick Bell, CEL, the Creative Exchange Lab, Yasmin Abir, and very much so the Office of Perkins Eastman, Ted Liebman, and the entire team in their New York and Washington offices that are providing the platform and organization for this series. I want to give sincere thanks to Rick Bell, a good friend, colleague, and a dynamic CSU board member for spearheading this Green City series. I invite you all to visit our CSU website, see our resources, see our six publications, and check out our upcoming uh, events, including next month's Green Cities event with Washington Fajardo, the chief planner for the city of Rio de Janeiro. Dan Zarilli is the chief climate policy advisor in the mayor's office of New York City, and as New York City director, was the principal author of the One New York City 2050, Building a Strong and Fair City. Dan is preparing America's largest city for the future and delivering on New York's Green New Deal. Under his leadership, New York City released its long-term strategic plan, One New York uh, City 2050, uh, a, uh, a document which I, I, I have here on my table, in case I want to refer to it. Um, since 2013, he's positioned New York City as the global leader in the fight against climate change. Notable successes include launching a comprehensive $20 billion climate adaption adaptation program, aligning the city's greenhouse gas reductions with the 1.5 centigrade target of the Paris Agreement, committing to divest the city's pension funds from fossil fuel reserve owners and invest billions in climate solutions suing fossil fuel companies for the damage caused by climate change and committing to end the expansion of fossil fuel infrastructure serving New York City. Um, if there's time, I will give you an anecdote as to how he's done this. Daniel served on NOAA, uh, the Advisory Committee for Sustained National Climate Assessment. He also concluded a three-year term with FEMA's National Advisory Council and advised the state of Louisiana on its 2017 Coastal Master Plan update. Previously, he was Senior Vice President for Asset Management at the New York City Economic Development Corporation and spent five years with Bechtel Infrastructure Corporation. Dan is a licensed professional engineer in New York, a fellow of the American Society of Civil Engineers, and holds an MS in Civil and Environmental Engineering from MIT, BS in Civil Engineering from Lehigh University, and he resides in New York, in Staten Island. On a more personal note, I recall inviting Dan to speak at the AIA New York chapter in 2011. That was the year before Sandy. As I recall, he had never addressed that architectural community. 
And uh, I believe it was the beginning of a very beautiful friendship. I also recall in 2014, sitting with the mayor and a small group of officials, associates, and industry leaders at the rollout of 80 by 50, the one New York City initiative. I can't tell you how impressed I was then, seven years ago, and continue to be at the potency of Dan's leadership in bringing New York City into the 21st century. I know there are going to be a lot of questions for Dan during this event. Please use the Q&A function uh, on the WebEx to submit your questions, and we will try to answer all of them. And now I give you my distinguished colleague, Daniel Zarelli. Dan. Fantastic. That is such a kind introduction, uh, Lance. I really appreciate that. I think I still need the um, ability to share my screen. So I'll do that in just a second when I have that capability. Um, but let me just uh, first say just how um, excited I am to be able to help kick off uh, this Green Cities 2021 um, lecture series. And of course, uh, starting with New York City always feels natural for uh, a New Yorker like me that we always like to go first and biggest. Um, so now I'm gonna share my screen. Um, hold on a second. And I'll, I'm, my, what I'm planning on doing today is walking through a, just a, um, a conversation and a series of slides around how New York City is thinking about um, the climate crisis and what we've been doing about it and some of the things that Lance mentioned in his introduction of me, um, as well as sort of this, this moment that we're in now, of course, in this year-long moment of COVID and the lessons we've learned and how that's um, been shaping our thinking about how to come out of this um, with a clear eye towards uh, the climate crisis and you know, sort of the looming public health crises that we know are coming from um, uh, from our, from climate change, um, and it's it's just really an honor to be able to, to be here to talk about the role of cities in uh, doing this. And New York City, of course, is not alone in this, and we've been partnered with cities across the globe in many of these efforts. And you'll hear about some of that today. And so, again, really thrilled to be able to kick off this. Um, uh, this global conversation because when it comes down to it cities are the place where the real action happens and um, you know with the changes in washington dc of course and the, the uh, supportive federal government all of that is incredibly important but so much of the work is going to continue to happen at the local level and i'm um, really thrilled to be part of this conversation um so uh, part of the so the, the one nyc program that we put out our, our long-term strategic plan uh, that we put out uh, the most recent version of in 2019 um, it at, had as, as its ambition um, three primary goals. One is confronting our climate crisis, um, acknowledging the challenges that we're in right now, um, but also at the same time, making sure we're looking broadly about the health and wealth inequities in our city, uh, in New York City, and doing everything we can to strengthen our democracy. It's become pretty clear to so many of us that um, fixing the challenges in our democracy um, here and probably around the globe is going to be critical in order to um, address all of the large challenges we have, including our climate crisis. And in doing so, we're really demonstrating what a, a Green New Deal looks like in action. And so we're going to talk about that um, a bunch throughout this um, throughout this session. First, though, I think it's important just to take stock of where we are with COVID. Um, you know, knowing that we've been through this now year-long crisis. Uh, that has exposed so many frail aspects of our society, whether it's the health outcomes, particularly associated with race and class, the economic crisis that we've uh, that we've seen, particularly for those at the lower end of the income scale, for communities of color, for immigrant communities, um, that you know put so many, and particularly in New York, put so many New Yorkers, um, you know, uh, food insecure, uh, struggling to pay rent. And, you know, the, the challenges that we've seen with those who are deemed essential, but the work conditions that they're living under um, and working under that we need to, to, to really recognize this, uh, these essential facts of what we've seen from the COVID crisis. Um, just, and just to put a few fine points on that, we see uh, the death rates by race and ethnicity, clearly disparities here um, in New York City. Um, a, a, a continuing economic crisis, unemployment rates that were um, double what they were a year ago today, even uh, in New York State and New York City, 
And so many of the jobs that were lost were at the low end of the, the pay scale in leisure, hospitality, food service sectors. And, and New Yorkers at the low end of the um, income scale, almost twice as likely to report household job losses. These are just like real challenging um, facts to grapple with and um, connect to our larger work on um, uh, economic equity and fairness in New York City. And again, making the finer point here on food insecurity and SNAP applications, which is our food stamps program, uh, almost 200%. Um, so many New Yorkers saying that they can't, that they're struggling to pay, uh, to pay rent in New York City. This is the the reality that we're living in now. And um, and and another way to, to look at this too, and on that highlights, I think, the economic challenges in New York City is our transit crisis. And you can see the rapid drop off of ridership here in New York City and a slow increase. But, um, you know, in, until I think we get past this moment of vaccines in arms, these numbers are not going to turn around in, uh, in, in a big way. And thankfully, there is that light at the end of the tunnel. Um, but what all this has really shown for us is that we're living through this this moment of converging risks, physical, social, economic risks that are amplifying each other, that are converging for sure, and that they're impacting our most marginal communities uh, first and worst. There's a, a clear corollary to what we're going to talk about for the rest of the session on climate change on this. But at, as we're as we're doing that, it's there's some larger context happening in New York City as well and some longer term trends that I'd want to put it uh, to highlight here. One is that our population is growing, even with a current um, small dip in population, the trends are still all pointing in a, in a growth rate. We're going to be 9 million people in New York City by 2040, um, and that's still projected to happen. Um, but we're also facing some real strong economic inequities across our country. Um, while we've seen productivity continue to rise, uh, wages have not kept up with that productivity, and it's left working families uh, not sharing in those general gains in our economy. And we've seen this play out locally with our poverty rates in New York City, where poverty rates are still far too high. Um, uh, so there was work before the pandemic where they were, that was coming down. We've, of course, stressed that. But the differences in poverty rates by race in New York City is very stark. Um, housing insecurity, rent burden, half of New Yorkers being rent burdened, uh, particularly at the low end of our income scale. And we know, and we laid this out in 1NYC even in 2019, that we, we face strains in our public health infrastructure and um, continue to be, of course, we're living through this um, COVID moment, uh, but there's so much more to do to make sure that we're ready for um, future infectious disease outbreaks because of our role, because of our density as a city, because of our role as an international travel hub, um, it, it can, it's going to continue to put New Yorkers at risk, and we're making big investments in the public health infrastructure here in New York City, and we'll continue to do so. And our infrastructure is just not serving the needs of the 21st century, whether it's our power sector, which needs to get greener, whether it's our transit infrastructure, um, you know, the, the, um, the risks that we saw from an incident like a Hurricane Sandy with blackouts and, um, and flood protection needs. And it, just yesterday, the American Society of Civil Engineers put out its nationwide report card for the nation's infrastructure and rated us as a C minus. Um, and I think that doesn't even fully account for the challenges of what climate change is going to bring to this infrastructure uh, going forward. And uh, this is also true in our digital infrastructure, the, the need to invest in uh, public systems. And just at this moment, when all these challenges are sort of piling up on each other, the, the national trust in government is at really almost all time lows. At this moment, when we need to be able to come together to solve our biggest problems, we have um, we face some really serious division and there's been threats to democracy across the globe. And we've seen that uh, play out over the last several years. And so, OK, that's a long intro of things that ne don't necessarily have a direct connection to climate ostensibly, and yet they are core to the storyline. Our climate crisis is going to build on top of all these challenges. It's going to cause a similar convergence of physical, social, and economic risks on top of the challenges that we face already. And we're going to talk a little bit about what we think that means here in New York City and what we're doing about it. So we've already seen uh, the impacts of climate change here in New York City, whether it's the example of Hurricane Sandy that killed 44 New Yorkers and caused $19 billion in damages and lost economic activity, whether it's the increasing heat and um, precipitation and rainstorm events uh, that we have in New York City. We've already been living it. It's not something that's happening far away, um, you know, a century from now to someone else. Um, we're all already living this, um, and, it's, and that's, that's also true in New York City, and it's only going to get worse. 
the New York City Panel on Climate Change, which is an esteemed group of academics and researchers that advise the mayor and the city on um, climate change projections and uh, help us think through the adaptation needs in New York City. They've been projecting a few of the numbers here that by 2050, of course, it's going to be hotter. We're going to have uh, an increase in temperature of 4.1 to 5.7 degrees Fahrenheit at the middle range of this of the um, projections. More rain in some parts of the country, obviously, are going to be more likely to have drought and other impacts. We're going to end up with more precipitation, 4 to 11 percent increase. Uh, sea level rise, a 1 to 2 foot rise in sea levels is the mid range of our projection by 2050. That's keep in mind, we've already seen a foot of sea level rise in New York City since 1900. Um, the high end of the projection is two and a half feet by 2050. And of course, 2050 is just an arbitrary date, right? It's, um, you know, the, that sea level rise is not going to stop in 2050. We have projections that go out now to 2100 that show that we could have as, as much as six feet or even higher um, at the high end of the, of the range, depending on the, the choices we make about our emissions and how places like Greenland and Antarctica um, react to those, um, those atmospheric changes. And, um, and we're going to see triple the number of days above 90 degrees. And, and maybe to put a fine point on that, the estimate is that New York City's um, climate will feel like Birmingham, Alabama's does today by the, by the 2050s. That's, um, that's a, a dramatically different climate. Um, a hotter climate than we've ever than we've seen here in New York City and that we currently deal with. And and as we're thinking about so the the impacts of climate change, well, um, of course, the drivers of that is greenhouse gas emissions, primarily driven by fossil fuel combustion. Um, and while New York City's greenhouse gas emissions have peaked and um, continue to go down at a, at a at a pace we need to speed up, and we'll talk about some of the ways in which we are bending that curve downward. Um, while New York City's emissions have peaked, global emissions continue to rise, and that, of course, means that whatever we're doing in New York City or in cities around the globe, um, we need uh, you know we're all continuing to be at risk because global emissions continue to rise. Here in New York City. Our emissions come from really three primary places, as you see on this um, this little pie chart. About two thirds of our emissions come from buildings, um, thirty percent from transportation. A lot of places have those um, that proportion flipped, but because of our density and our transportation system, our subway system, um, buildings account for most uh, of New York City's emissions, with waste taking up a little sliver as well. Uh, just to give you a sense, and that helps understand where we've been prioritizing our efforts in particular around buildings. And so all of this convergence of risk, all of the, um, the uh, growing inequalities, all of the, uh, the challenges in our democracy and in our society, and of course the stress that's coming from climate change, all of this convergence of risk really requires an integrated approach to urban resilience. There's, no, um, there's really no way to peel these issues apart and say, we're, just, we're gonna start by tackling this issue and then that issue and then the other issue. If you're not thinking about these in a combined way, you're you're missing the point, and you're you're probably more likely to fail. And so here in New York City, our Green New Deal approach is really about laying the foundation for transformational change, confronting our cl climate crisis, preparing for those growing risks, addressing the health and wealth inequities across our city, and bringing all New Yorkers into the civic and democratic life of our city and, and making everyone welcome in, um, in, this, uh, in this journey that we need to be doing to build a stronger and fairer city. We laid out this vision in 2019, um, uh, where we um, set eight primary goals for ourselves to achieve those three um, so our overarching um, uh, missions for ourselves, but a vibrant democracy. We want to build an inclusive economy, thriving neighborhoods. You can read the, the rest on here. Um, but this really is a, a, a full and integrated approach to strategic uh, planning in New York City that lays out the roadmap for uh, the kind of things that we're aiming for and how we're going to get there. And um, I'm going to spend most of the time here now going through the section on a livable climate, our target for a livable climate, and really um, ending the age of fossil fuels, getting ourselves away from fossil fuels, and the things we're doing to, um, to achieve that kind of target. It starts for us 
with four major things. We are committed, and you heard Lance say this, um, an 80% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, as well as um, achieving carbon neutrality as a city by 2050. So deep, um, deep emission cuts um, and carbon neutrality on top of that. Well, that's gonna require that we secure 100% clean electricity, that we basically stop burning things for our energy systems and we plug more things in. And so 100 based and, and, and then need 100% clean electricity, renewable energy in order to supply those energy needs for a city like New York City. Um, that means retrofitting our buildings. We have world leading uh, legislation that we've now passed uh, that requires existing buildings to retrofit um, in line with those targets, 80% reduction in their greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. We're working with the federal government on congestion pricing um, to help deal with the uh, congestion and air quality and emissions from the transportation sector and to help fund our subway system. Um, we are strengthening our resiliency. We're fighting for climate accountability and justice by divesting our pension funds from fossil fuels. We're working on um, a whole brand new uh, program of work around environmental justice, which I'll touch upon later, and making sure that as we're doing this, we are investing in the climate solutions that create jobs. And this all does connect back to our current moment because it really is clear to us that the types of green uh, job creation, investing in clean energy, investing in resilient infrastructure and environmental justice is going to create the jobs that's going to accelerate our economic recovery out of this current moment that we're in. So these issues are very much um, not unrelated. Um, uh, let me start with uh, what we're doing and, and what the landscape looks like on our efforts to, uh, to achieve 100% clean electricity. Um, so in, in one NYC, that basic point of we need to stop burning things, we need to fully electrify our city and end our reliance on fossil fuels that will require this transformation of our city's buildings, energy, transportation, and waste sectors. Um, to get there, we're starting in a bit of a hole where fossil fuels make up about 46% of our state's electricity mix, um, and most of that comes from natural gas. But we do it, we do it, we have um, a really in New York State, we face a, uh, really like a tale of two grids where there's a very clean upstate grid, but because of some transmission constraints and the um, reliability requirements to have in city power generation um, within the five boroughs within New York City itself, um, we end up having a, a more fossil dependent New York City grid. And you see that about two thirds. Of our, um, of our electricity comes from fossil fuels here in New York City right now. And as we are uh, facing the closure of a, of a nearby um, nuclear power plant, Indian Point, we're pretty much digging ourselves a deeper hole on the carbon side uh, where that 67% is gonna turn into you know, almost 90%. Uh, and some people have calculated that even higher for what sort of fossil fuel mix could be in our uh, electricity sector um, in the next several years. And so this has really been driving the urgency for New York City um, to make sure that we are enacting the world leading policy that we need to um, really drive building retrofits. And I talked about buildings making up about two thirds of the city's um, greenhouse gas emissions. Well, um, upgrades to existing building codes um, is one strategy, but we know that 90% or so of buildings that exist today are still going to exist in 2050, which is why we advanced and enacted uh, legislation in order to drive retrofits of existing buildings in line with that 80% reduction. And this was a hard fought battle and there were plenty of folks in the real estate industry that weren't too happy with this. Uh, but we know that if we're going to get our uh, our greenhouse gas emissions under control, we need to be retrofitting those buildings, um, and we bake that into our uh, into our energy code going forward, which is a really world leading moment uh, that other cities are I know are looking at and trying to figure out how to do there as well. Um, but that also means it that we need to be ramping up the investments into renewables and rooftop solar and offshore wind um, and other uh, you know other uh, renewables like hydropower, which I'll talk about. Uh, in a second, um, and at the same time, stopping new fossil fuel infrastructure. And Mayor de Blasio signed an executive order last year, um, basically saying that our point of view now is that we are opposed to, to expansions of fossil fuel infrastructure into New York City. Um, we need to be able to say no to fossil fuels, but that means saying yes to the um, investments and the, the investments into renewables and solar and wind and hydro that is going to replace that uh, that fossil base that we have now in our electricity sector um, and investments in sustainable infrastructure. And we'll talk about that in a second as well. 
And so, and even just more recently in, in the mayor's 2021 state of the city, um, as part of the recovery from COVID, uh, we haven't lost sight of the looming climate crisis and the mayor certainly hasn't lost sight of that. Um, we committed to connect New York City to clean Canadian hydropower as one more source of clean electricity that comes into New York City with new transmission coming into New York City as well. So we can turn off those um, dirty power plants that are in the city, providing uh, you know better air quality for New Yorkers and our environmental justice communities. Um, new investments in bike boulevards and bike lanes over the East River bridges, like the Brooklyn Bridge and the, the Manhattan Bridge, uh, I'm sorry, the Queensboro Bridge. Um, and we, he, he, we stated and we laid out a plan for the first time to stop gas connections for new construction, um, new gas hookups. And this is a trend that's really going across the country in, in, in a lot of different cities. Uh, where we're saying no more gas connections in new construction. And so we're going to be working to ban those uh, in our in our building codes going forward. And so even with all that, of course, you know, when we can achieve all this additional energy efficiency, offshore wind, solar, hydro, more battery and energy storage, we still have a in 2030 still face a an electricity grid that is 36% uh, based on fossil fuels. So between that and then 2040, we still have plenty more to do in order to, to get ourselves to our, um, our commitment of 100% clean electricity. Um, but it puts, a, uh, puts us very much on, uh, on the way to achieve that goal. And hydropower is one part of our strategy where we're, um, that is uh, really exciting for us and we're looking to secure that this year. Um, new clean baseload power that helps us improve local air quality as well. And, um, you know, all of this is part of a strategy to make sure that we're dealing with the environmental injustice of burning those fossil fuels in communities in New York City, which has been driving air quality and asthma concerns. Uh, we really need to make get natural gas out of our out of our energy system. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit more about as well our effort to divest from fossil fuels. This has been something of a journey for New York City, where in um, in 2018, we laid out, um, you know, some some pretty clear economic rationale for why New York City should be getting away from fossil fuels. And we've, we've seen the fossil fuel securities underperform the marketplace. Uh, the outlook continues to be poor. Of course, the policy landscape is pushing more and more towards renewables. Um, and so in 2018, um, we made a commitment with our pension funds to divest from fossil fuels um, completely from our pension funds. As of today, three years later, we are now divested from $4.1 billion of fossil fuels in three of the city's pension funds. We're on track to double our investments into climate solutions to the tune of $4 billion from $2 billion um, only three years ago. And in uh, in that same state of the city speech a few weeks ago, the mayor said, we're going to build on that success of having divested and, and delivering on this investment solution into climate solutions. Um, we want a fully net zero portfolio by 2040 and upwards of $50 billion of climate solutions investments by 2035. So again, you know, we need to be getting ourselves away from fossil fuels, but that means we also need to be willing to, to seize the opportunities and have the courage to seize the opportunities to invest in the climate solutions like the hydro and the wind and the solar that are going to get us off of fossil fuels. Um, and as we've been doing this, I think a really important, important and exciting part of this work has been coming together with other global cities to share our work on fossil fuel divestment. Here you see um, Mayor de Blasio and Mayor Khan from London. Um, we came together in partnership with C40 cities. Uh, in order to develop the tools and the tactics and the strategies to help other cities uh, along the path to make those same sort of commitments um, and has resulted in a, a nearly an additional $100 billion of assets across another 12 cities that are committing to divest. Really exciting work where we've been laying out the toolkits and the, the legal rationales for, um, for cities that can step up and take, take those divestment actions. Uh, we've been doing that through the U.S. Conference of Mayors. We've been doing that with C40 and, and uh, groups like ICLEI. Uh, been really helpful in sharing this message about the transformative power of finance um, in order to change, uh, you know, change the, the, the underlying systems that are driving fossil fuel investment, driving fossil fuel uh, pollution uh, across the globe. And divestment is one more tool that I think is, is really important to send that message and to um, not only uh, do the right thing by the climate and get away from fossil fuels, but protect our pensioners as well who rely on those funds 
And we know that those the, those fossil fuel stocks have been underperforming. And the last piece I want to go a little bit deeper on here um, is around our work on environmental justice. And this has been critical to New York City. In 2017, we enacted new laws to embed environmental justice into the city's decision making. Uh, you know, these are new tools that we are now working through the analysis um, in order to embed environmental justice into city decision making. Well, that means thinking about the historic um, burdens that have been placed on our environmental justice communities um, and sharing the benefits of climate action more broadly across the city, um, as well as, um, you know, in, in particular, the exclusion from decision making that has happened. We now have environmental justice advisory board that is helping the city think through all these questions um, across the administration's actions as we are, um, whether it's investing in renewable energy or thinking about waste equity um, across the city, all, a number of questions that are coming up around um, how do we better serve our communities and how do we better bring more New Yorkers into uh, the decision-making process and to the civic life of our city and, and have ownership um, over how the city is addressing our climate crisis. And so we're working through to uh, not only establish an advisory board and a working group of agencies, but we're putting out a first ever environmental justice for all report that's going to lay out a, uh, a first ever look at the environmental justice concerns broadly across New York City, as well as a plan on what we're going to be doing about it um, and, and continuing to embed those EJ concerns into our city's decision making. And so through all of this, I guess it's clear, it's been clear to us that with these converging crises, um, we are not just looking to, um, you know, come out of this COVID moment and go back to what was what felt like normal or what, what where we were before. We really have to respond to this crisis with an effort to bring back our economy and our society, yes, but to do it in a way that makes things better and addresses the longstanding challenges we've had in New York City. Um, that, of course, we um, talked through and laid out earlier in the in this uh, in this slide deck, um, it really is about coming out of this in a much stronger and better and fairer place, and that's what's been driving us. And as we're doing this, of course, the you know the entirety of our uh, Green New Deal agenda means that we need to uh, work to address those health and wealth inequities, and this means tackling uh, you know some of the historic segregation issues in our schools and really ensuring equity and excellence in our schools. Um, health and mental health, housing and making sure we have enough affordable housing, guaranteeing health care for every New Yorker, and all with a focus on the, the jobs of the future that are that are coming from all this investment. And at the same time, really um, pulling this all together into thinking about how we're strengthening our democracy, expanding voting rights. We had a really phenomenal success with the census this year in New York City. Um, and even during the COVID crisis, um, you know, hit all of the benchmarks that we needed to achieve on the census count. Um, and we're doing this locally, but we're also doing this globally and engaging, whether it's um, with the sustainable development goals and we've aligned our entire strategic plan for New York City with the, the SDGs, um, but also partnering with, uh, with um, city networks and other global cities to help drive all of this work going forward. And one place where this is this becomes really exciting, and, and this is topical right now, is thinking about how a green recovery can take us out of this um, out of this crisis moment from COVID. Well, we just passed uh, legislation to reimagine Rikers Island. For those who don't know Rikers Island, it's the city's historic jail complex. It's been a historic stain on the city in so many different ways, and we are now committed to closing that jail complex. Um, uh, building much smaller and community um, scale uh, jail complexes. But the focus really is on what we do with this island and how do we repurpose this island um, to, to help us meet our goals of climate justice, economic equity and fairness, uh, really redressing the harms to the communities that have um, that justice impacted communities from the island and help and thinking about the waterfront access opportunities. We just passed new legislation that not only transfers the the ownership of the island from our corrections department to our um, uh, to other other agencies, but um, with particular focus on studying the renewable energy, the um, the green jobs opportunities that can come out of Rikers Island. I think it really just encapsulates like so much of what we think of as the Green New Deal, uh, investing in confronting our climate crisis, the job creation, and um, and really being part of addressing those um, uh, those inequities that we faced across our city. 
you know, and, and as we're doing this, and I'll say this again, the, um, our, our vision on how to, one way to, that we're going to get out of this COVID crisis is in the job creation. We're going to accelerate our economic recovery with um, investments into clean energy, resilient infrastructure, environmental justice, um, as we're working to end the age of fossil fuels and pursue that just transition to a clean energy economy. And we're doing that across the globe. We've um, joined with global mayors to endorse C40s, uh, cities, um, their commitment of principles on a, a green and just recovery. Um, and we're also doing that locally at home and seizing the opportunity to rethink our streetscape and, you know, open streets and open restaurants and more bus busway and bike infrastructure, uh, you know, seizing this opportunity in the COVID moment to really think about our, our streetscape and how that can play a role in creating a more livable um, and, uh, and sustainable future for New York City. And so that's hopefully this is um, a nice overview of how we're thinking about the challenges we face, but the work we're doing to secure that livable future for the next generation. This is, um, you know, this is not easy work, but New York City is committed to continuing to lead the way and try out those new solutions and um, and work with cities across the globe as we're all working towards, um, you know, a more livable future. So uh, with that, I thank you for this opportunity. I'm looking forward to questions and let me come back to Lance. Uh, thank you very much, Dan. Um, you covered a lot of territory. Not an easy <laughs> job. You, you, uh, you, you again lived up, maybe exceeded expectations. Thank you very much. We have um, a nice array of questions and uh, they, they cluster in certain areas. Um, I think I, in the introduction said, I would refer back perhaps to an anecdote, which I will, which was a meeting that I went to with you and the mayor and Steve Goldsmith and John Lee and others, and industry leaders and professionals where one person, nobody being named, uh, representing one of the fossil fuel industries, asked the, uh, asked the leadership um, how they might help to convert to a less uh, fossil fuel dependent future. And uh, that question was asked to the mayor. He kicked it to Steve. Steve kicked it to you. You kicked it. Nobody wanted to really answer the question. Um, but when somebody finally did, I forget who it was, they said, well, you don't really have a future. You know, we're trying to get rid of you guys. Uh, I thought it was as powerful a moment in leadership as I'd ever seen because it was in fact arisen now or to the point, meaning. For those who've asked whether uh, green energy and renewables is a very serious question. There is the issue, as you mentioned very, very well, of the employment of people who are in industries that may become obsolete, an issue I have heard so profoundly discussed at the level of the United Nations in terms of moving the whole globe in another direction, giving dependency on coal and other things in other nations. And then the discrete minor issues that might respond to that, including one from Wayne Benjamin about how perhaps uh, might people be helped in the funding of retrofitting buildings to make them less dependent um, on, on uh, existing energy sources. And I thought that might be a not bad place to start, but I would like to also move in the direction, if I might be so bold as to just say the word Indian point, go from retrofitting to replace energy replacement. Well, I mean, you, you raise a lot of interesting points in that. And I think, you know, our approach on this has been like, we know that fossil burning fossil fuels is what's causing this crisis. We need to do everything we can to get off of that. And for us, that's a that's a range of activities, um, you know, and it starts first and foremost with energy efficiency. We need to be using a whole lot less energy um, and whether that's retrofitting buildings, whether that is, uh, you know, and, and I think that's a big part of it. Um, the, the, the least amount of energy that we can use is where we need to be getting ourselves to and then finding ways to replace that with an array of renewable energy. And that means, you know, not just solar and um, and wind, which of course has its intermittency uh, challenges. We need things like hydropower, which can help provide, um, you know, the the firm power we have. We need things like more geothermal and district heating systems. 
energy storage. There's, a, there's an array of solutions that we need to put together through a smart grid that helps us transition away from what we have now to something that works entirely differently. Um, and, you know, there's, of course, a lot of conversation about there out there about how electric vehicles can, you know, it, as that adoption ramps up more, that there's more battery storage that people can use on their buildings and their homes. I think there's a lot of really interesting smart grid technologies out there and grid edge technologies out there that are going to be part of this solution. But we have to be able to name what the problem is. And I think your anecdote from that meeting a couple of years ago is is still spot on that, you know, we, this is not going to be an easy transition. We need to make sure that we're supporting the workers through this transition. And at the same time, we need to we need to know where we're going, which needs to get off of fossil fuels, uh, because that's continuing to cause so much inequity and so much challenge in our in our uh, in our across the globe. So if, if I could differ from that to what I said would be a segue to Indian point and actually a question that was raised by one of our attendees. Uh, I'm thinking of three names. I'm thinking of Bill Gates. I'm thinking of Stuart Brand. I'm thinking of people who, while no one in this country wants to stand up and scream nuclear energy because, you know, it has psychological effects. We are a guilt-ridden nation because of the Second World War. Um, somebody told me that what we call magnetic resonance imaging MRIs in the United States in other parts of the world are called NRIs nuclear resonance imaging but we don't use that word because it's it's forbidden um some people think that is um a road to the future as we decommission i know the french have been selling reactors around the world they almost sent what they almost built one here in maryland some 5 years ago and they got 95% of the way through the approvals and in the end, of course, didn't make it. Is that ever part of the conversation? You know, it's, what's kind of funny is that uh, I deal on the city scale a lot. And so nuclear doesn't really come up in the conversation because we're not going to cite a nuclear plant in New York City. And I think that's been some of the challenge with Indian Point is just its proximity to a large urban center. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we always took the position that you know, we we were never we were never taking a firm position on whether or not Indian Point should or should not close. We were always uh, drawing the line on well, if it does, here are the things you need to be able to replace in our energy sector, and that's you know, and whether it's things like the air quality benefits, the affordability benefits that it provides, and certainly the low carbon energy. And unfortunately, some of those fears have borne themselves out because Indian Point is likely in the short term to be replaced by natural gas. So, you know, thinking nationally, and this isn't necessarily New York City sort of opinion, uh, but nationally, it seems like maybe we should be keeping in operation at, at a minimum the, the the nuclear plants we currently have because they are providing that low carbon energy right now. As this transition continues to um, to go forward, the regulatory environment and the example you just used in Maryland is, and there's others as well. It's been so hard to build anything new in this regard that. It's hard to imagine that's real, like building new nuclear is part of the the rapid set of solutions we need over the next decade to um, to transition our energy system. Uh, so I think there's a whole host of just challenges there. But you know why shouldn't we keep most of the um, existing facilities in operation? It doesn't seem like a bad idea, but it's not exactly something we're going to be ramping up. Uh, you know, no no one's calling for for nuclear power plants within the five boroughs of New York City. That's for sure. No, understood. I, I think we would talk about much larger regional and national policy yes. as the French have. Um, uh, you know, switching gears, much of what you said, you you did a, a masterful job of laying out the challenges that we face. And, and they're manifold. There are many challenges. We've had them before COVID, uh, um, before even uh, climate change. Uh, they've amplified. But I, I think your focus towards the end on um, opportunities to do good, um, shining, illuminating op opportunity uh, with your mention of Rikers Island and what it might be. I don't know why, as you mentioned Rikers Island, I also thought of, you know, the opportunities afforded by Governor's Island or all places that, and, and I'm gonna, now I'm gonna meld this with another good question that was raised early on. The use of land in New York City, 
and the ways in which land is being used in other cities around the world, I'm thinking Rio, with the creation of community land trusts, community mm -hmm. land banks, things that somehow uh, direct a legacy of accessibility for housing and other uses that aren't directly tied to, you know, dare I mention, the tax base. Um, so uh, can you can you talk a little bit about the overall strategy towards the use of city land going forward? It's a great question. And I think, you know, some of what we laid out earlier around the housing crisis that we face in New York City and the, and the affordability crisis that is really connected to that. Um, we have been continuing to develop more and more affordable housing. The mayor laid out targets for 300,000 units of uh, protected and developed, and we've been hitting those targets even um, even during this last year during COVID, there's been a, a range of activity on affordable housing development. And, you know, the issue of community land trusts comes up quite a bit, and there's been um, a positive movement there in different communities in New York City. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity to really change the economic models for um, community ownership for those kind of assets. I think that is true in housing. That's also probably true in energy, um, where there's a lot of opportunities for um, for different economic models to help us out of these, um, you know, these converging crises. You brought up Governor's Island, which is a, a, another interesting example um, that is not in my slide deck, of course, but is a great example. Um, they are moving forward on Governor's Island with um, with proposals to change their own land use in order to build out a climate solutions um, institution. Uh, and so they are really looking to be a place where uh, the climate solutions and the adaptation needs can be tested and um, and uh, like new ideas can be, I guess, validated and uh, and investigated and using that island as a home for bringing together the private sector and universities and government in a collaborative way to advance those kind of climate solutions. So there are some really interesting things happening there. Um, and of course, it's proximity to Lower Manhattan makes it a different island, of course, than Rikers Island. So they present just very different opportunities um, that we're working to achieve at this point. Uh, uh, you know, uh, again, um, thank you for that. I, I, I think I, I don't want to stay too much, by the way, on the energy issue, but fission and fusion and the, the people listening in seem to be there, at least a, a certain number who are focused on that being investigated. I'll leave it at that because I know it's a bigger issue than the city alone can address, but it's a national policy and we'll see because it, it goes against all of the issues that that uh, uh, we discuss, hydropower and solar. And uh, I've heard things that do unpack the idea of how renewable are wind turbines and solar when you look at the at the extraction and the energy to produce them and what you do them when when they become obsolete the life cycling of all of these things it's a big mm -hmm. issue and i i feel confident that we're looking at it um both discreetly and largely on another issue that had to goes back a little bit to the land use land planning issues there are those who've raised the questions about should we be evacuating we all know there are constant discussions and programs on should we be retreating and is retreating elevating or pushing away um, everything to do with, I guess, the most immediate heat is an issue, but sea level rise and storm surge are more to the point, everything to do with our 520 miles of waterfront, which mm -hmm. my last investigation suggested there was absolutely no coordination between the barriers. You could build a barrier for a piece of Brooklyn and all the water would flood behind it. Um, can you talk a little bit to the overall strategy of securing the shores? Yeah, this has been something that's been sort of, uh, very high profile in New York City, obviously, since Hurricane Sandy, and um, the city has been moving forward on a range of, of programs, over $20 billion of investments, and that is things around coastal protections, for sure, and coastal protections that work, um, as well as uh, investments in housing and uh, whether that's uh, you know, a lot, there's been a lot of elevation of homes after Hurricane Sandy, thousands of homes across the, the five boroughs in some of the most impacted areas. There were some targeted buyout areas as well that happened in Staten Island and other parts of the city, um, but also infrastructure upgrades and a lot of um, uh, what we think of as community or social resilience um, efforts as well. And that also brings in the heat questions. Um, so I think we've been taking a very comprehensive approach to 
Um, the adaptation and resilience needs of the city sea level rise is sort of an, one of those just inexorable sort of challenges that is just going to keep coming and coming and is going to put more and more stress on some of our waterfront communities. So there's been really interesting work in our Department of City Planning, looking at land use. They've already um, done some contextual downzonings and um, uh, in, in particularly uh, vulnerable parts of the city um, in order to limit the potential for future uh, vulnerability in those, in those communities. There's also been um, some new work that's coming in front of the City Planning Commission on um, uh, on on baking in more of those uh, adaptation and coastal resiliency needs into our zoning resolutions as a city, and so there these are hard questions, and and not just on the political sense, but even in the technical sense of how to how to address these challenges and who pays for it, and 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 who who bears the burden in all of these things, wh which communities go first, that we're trying to to work through in a really equitable way as a city to make sure that we are. Um, you know, reducing the vulnerability of what we have, we're protecting certain parts of the city where that makes sense. Um, we're elevating homes where that makes sense. And in some cases, there's some places where, you know, perhaps people shouldn't be living and that's already happened here and in, uh, in, in certain parts of our coastal communities. So these are, these are challenging issues, but we've got, we've, with help from the federal government in the post Sandy world, we've been making a lot of investment um, and, and more of that to come as some of the bigger coastal protection projects like the Eastside Coastal Resiliency and Lower Manhattan Coastal Resiliency and uh, projects in Staten Island and the Rockaway Peninsula continue to move forward. Um, once again, kind of switching gears, I think there have been a series of questions that really have to do with the issue of uh, action and I guess to a large extent compliance um uh local law 97 other issues of benchmarking um do, do we have the capacity to, for the city to actually ensure that our excellent policies and i mean that sincerely um can actually have the full effect we intend or white roofs whatever they may be relative to our ability to ensure compliance with regulations it's a great question and i think we've set up a, a i think a over time, we've set up a really smart policy apparatus here where we now have, what is it, almost a decade of benchmarking information for the largest buildings, 25,000 square feet and up. Uh, it started at 50,000 and then we, we brought that down um, to encompass more buildings, which of course are our most polluting buildings because they're the largest. And based on that benchmarking information, now we can use that to help do the compliance and the the um, the checking on the local law 97 requirements. So there's the information is public. We we know what it is. Buildings have to report, and they now have deadlines in which they need to um, to retrofit their buildings to drive down their energy use. I mean, one of our key challenges is that the governor right now in the state and uh, has a, a proposal in his current budget uh, in order to really undermine the goal of local law 97, which is something we're very opposed to. Um, we need to make sure that we can protect local law 97, strengthen it where need be but not undermine it by any means. And so um, we're fighting back against that and we need to make sure that we can be successful there um, because this is like the biggest uh, climate action to drive down our emissions that we have as a city is local on 97 and we need that to be successful. And the policy apparatus very much supports that, whether it's the benchmarking and the compliance, the PACE financing that's gonna help building owners make those investments um, a whole range of things that we're doing to make sure through our retrofit accelerator that we're aligning the technical know-how, the financing opportunities, um, the incentives as they may exist in order to actually achieve those goals. Great. I, I have two more questions. Um, I'll, I'll try to keep them really short. We're kind of out of time. Uh, one is really based on um, the shock and surprise and uh, uh, absolutely pleasant response I had the day that I saw at the open open uh, end of the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel, the immense multi-ton doors. <laughs> yes. Close that and the, and the Queens Midtown, things that I know we had discussed and they were beautifully done and they were visible. You know, if you were aware of them as you drove in the times, so look at that, that's gonna save billions of dollars. So my first question, is there anything else like that that's hidden in the infrastructure of New York that's happened that you know the, the common uh, observer might not see? Those are so visible and it was so powerful for me. But that's one. The second, and I'm gonna segue because I just wanna save time. After you answer that, 
what advice do you have for the next mayor? And that'll be the last question. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, yeah, I mean, there's so many things that have happened after Hurricane Sandy, visible and invisible across the city. And I think those gates are a really great example of the visible. Um, you know, we we worked with um, Con Ed to invest over a billion dollars uh, through their rate case several years ago to upgrade the the distribution and transmission of um, of energy across the city. That's that's now much more protected against uh, against the risks of climate change. And they're also doing more and studying what else can be done. So there's there are things that have happened in our um, in our water supply system, in our electricity sector, the subway and transportation sector. A lot of it you wouldn't see, um, but we are very much in a different place than we were with Sandy. Some of the bigger things that now need to still happen is those um, larger scale coastal protections that, you know, we got um, some of them done at a smaller scale in places like Staten Island and the Rockaway Peninsula and other places. Um, but some of the bigger investments that are still coming on top of those or on the Lower East Side of Manhattan um, are still very much in the works and, um, and heading towards construction at this point. Look, if I were to give, and I, I'm, I'm not sure I'm the person to give advice to the next mayor, but we'll see if they want to hear from me or, uh, or folks like me. But I think keep, keeping up the focus on this challenge, because it's going to define the next decade um, here in New York City and around the globe. And so, um, you know, don't lose sight of the need to drive down emissions. Don't lose sight of the need to continue to invest in adaptation and resilience and make sure that we are using every lever at our disposal um, to drive solutions on the climate crisis. And there's just so many different things that can be done as a city. Um, but also don't just approach them from the technocratic, um, you know, whether it's greenhouse gas emissions or sea level rise challenges, these issues are connected to people. These issues are connected to the inequalities that we face in our city. And in order to really get at the heart of the solutions we need, we need everybody to be part of this. And I think that that is really a key message of the environmental justice movement um, for in New York City. Great. All hands on deck. I love that as a closing. Um, Dan, if we were in Japan, I would nominate you as a living treasure. Um, maybe we can do that one day in America. I can't thank you enough for um, how um, uh, intelligently and uh, in an omnibus way you deliver the issues of the day for New York City. And I hope people listening elsewhere have benefited from what we do. Uh, I'd like to thank Rick for um, conceiving and spearheading this. I'd like to thank Perkins Eastman again for hosting us. Um, uh, I, I want to remind you we have an upcoming event in a month from now with Washington Fajardo, but before that, as a little bit of a shout out for the Consortium for Sustainable Urbanization, uh, the organizer and presenter of this, we have our gala on March 18th, anyone who cares to join uh, and help celebrate the lives of Ed Mazria, who many of you know. Uh, an early champion of energy conscious design, Signe Nielsen, one of our not born, but homegrown, wonderful landscape architects, and Andrew Whaley of uh, Grimshaw, a globally responsible architectural firm, will be celebrated. Again, look at our books, sign on our website, come back and visit with us again, and uh, thank you all. Thank you.